Thank you, Ray, and welcome to the Saturday Night Showdown. And what a week it's been. A few days on from threatening to arrest someone for being openly Jewish, London's police moved on to arresting people for being openly English. After months of standing by during the Palestinian riots, they finally saw some protesters that they could batter without being called racist by The Guardian and promptly kettled them, threw them on the ground and had mounted police staging cavalry charges into them. The police response wasn't just heavy-handed, it was heavy-hooved. There was no need to consult community leaders or be aware of social tensions when it's a group seen as gamins. Compare this to the treatment of other protesters over the last six months. The police stood meekly by while Islamists threw fireworks and missiles at police, desecrated war memorials, chanted anti-Semitic slogans, displayed swastikas and called for jihad, which the police excused as having a number of meanings. Yeah, I'm pretty sure jihad just has one meaning when it's shouted by a foaming-mouthed Hamas supporter who wants to destroy Israel. <laughs> Left-wing commentators say the St. George's Day protesters are far right, but the anti-Israel protesters aren't. So the protesters with swastikas and anti Semitic chants aren't Nazis, but the ones with England flags, a country that fought the Nazis, are the Nazis? Can someone please make this make sense? And social media was awash with the annual St George's Day parade of smug superior lefties saying, well, actually, St George was a Turkish Arab immigrant and his mother was a Palestinian. Take that, gammons! As if this was some kind of edgy, jaw-dropping revelation instead of the only acceptable opinion. And something you'll see a million times if you open social media on the 23rd of April. And as well as being trite and smug, it's not even correct. If I can adopt the snobbish know-it-all tones of the leftist chatterati, well, actually, St George wasn't a Turkish Arab, but was a Greek Christian from Anatolia, which used to be Christian, but was aggressively colonised by Islam. So maybe digging into St George's history doesn't make the point you think you're making. Calling him a Turkish Arab is like saying Keanu Reeves is a high-ranking member of Hezbollah because he was born in Beirut. See, we can be know-it-alls too. And St George is revered in the East as a curer of lunatics, so we could certainly do with him today. I am joined tonight by Paul Cox, Andrew Eborn, and Kezia Noble. Why do you think English people don't celebrate St George? Se they seem to be uh, almost embarrassed to, to celebrate it. Yeah, they do seem pretty embarrassed, don't, don't they? You see, like, everyone celebrating St Patrick's Day. They, I think that the English like to celebrate St Patrick's Day mm -hmm. even more than St George's Day. Uh, it's just been now linked with racism, hasn't it? So yeah. they're just very uncomfortable with it. And uh, they probably see, you know, they, they've been told, you know, England was the, it was, it was part of the empire, it was the empire, you know, and we have to feel Great guilty times. about that. But, but Scotland and Wales were part of that empire also, yeah. <laughs> you know. I know that it was like, that, OK, Wales is a principality, I understand, but, you know, back in the days of the empire, they were, they were soldiers also and yeah, absolutely. marching on other people's land and all the rest and of it. And there were plenty but... of Scottish uh, slave traders. And, oh, there, and there were some oh, Scottish slaves as well. There were, absolutely. Well, it is interesting. I always say that trust comes in on foot and leaves on horseback. And the reality is that it's about communication. Yeah. At the moment, it looks like there are tears everywhere, more than two, I would have thought, mm. with, with the police on that sort of basis. What they need to do is be very, very clear as to the policy. So let's put it in this perspective. There's Section 60AA of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. Well, of 1994. Of <laughs> I can tell you, the clock's already ticking. But, there, that, but that can empower them to say, you can remove uh, anything that might conceal your faces and so on and so forth. So they yeah. put that order in on St George's Day. So all the people in their English outfits had to take them and things off. But they didn't when there were the Palestinian marches. Yeah. So yeah. they could cover their face. So there's an inconsistency yeah. there. What they need to do is about, it's about clarity. And I put the other perspective, because we like to balance. I've read the notes. Um, you've got to be balanced. Uh, I felt a bit sorry for the copper yeah. who turned around and put the other perspective with a guy who, when he said he was openly Jewish, he didn't mean it in an anti-Semitic way. Yeah. What he was trying to say is, look, it's a bit dangerous it's a, because if you go over there, pro Palestinian month, you might come to harm. Yeah, the and reality therefore, of the situation was the, the crowd could see it as a provocation. And I think that's the thing. It's rather like saying, hang about your, um, I don't know, if, if you're black and uh, there's a whole load of National Front people over yeah. there, you want to warn them. That, it's about that guy safety. Was an agitator, by the way. Oh, well, he was making that's a the point. point, and he was making a good point, but he was an agitator. Yeah. And the reason there's a two-tier system, I don't. Do, I don't believe that the police are pro-Palestine. No. I don't believe that. It's the sheer number yeah. they're dealing yeah. with here. 
It's huge. And most of them are peaceful, but yes. you've got this mob, and I've seen them. They're young men, yeah. they've got their faces I covered like cowards, and you can see they're looking for a fight. Yeah, they yeah. are looking for yeah, a fight. I get it. And if something triggers that, it all hell will break loose. But Andrew raises an interesting point. He said, you know, if this was, uh, you know, a, a black person yep. of a National Front mob, a National Front mob would never, ever be allowed to, Only to march of the numbers, yes, in London. Exactly. The numbers are small. If those were like 50,000, 60,000 people, they would also have to manage it differently. Yes. Yeah, but it, I mean, the, the reality of the I've situation been, was, is that it, I, that it just isn't. I was on the anti lockdown marches. You know, and they were huge, much yeah, bigger than this. Yeah. And to be honest, it got a bit hairy sometimes, really? but they couldn't do anything because of the size. That's the lockdown, yeah. because no barbers were available. That, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why they got hairy. He, he was your... antagonising, wasn't he? But he did expose he was. something, right? Yes. Yeah. He did expose something, and that was that there was the potential for danger. And we've been continually yeah. told there is no potential for danger because these are peaceful protests. Yes. Mm. So what he, what he successfully managed to do, and single-handedly on this yes. occasion, was expose it for what it is, that element that Kezia was talking about. Out, does exist, and we shouldn't deny it. But, but, minority, but also, the, the though, interest... most of the people would not have done anything to that man. No, They're I agree, peaceful I agree. people I... that are upset but, about... But, but you don't want it to be inflammatory. And the other thing which I think they handled incorrectly, the police, and I say, we're just putting the other side, is when you come out and apologise and say, well, yes, yeah. it almost means as though, well, it was racist, it was anti-Semitic and things like that. And it wasn't. I don't think that was the intention. I think it really was to do with safety and so on and so forth. It's rather like the orange marches, which they do. There are certain streets you can't go down. Yeah. But it's inflammatory. Well, Work on that they, basis. They should be sponsored by EasyJet. But <laughs> it wasn't the only protest this week. There was also Rhys Mogg, Jacob Rhys Mogg, being harassed by pro-Palestine students, I believe it was in, in Wales. We've got a video well, of us. Yeah, it's in Cardiff. Now, those protesters, as well as being real, right up in his face. I mean, yes. he's, he's got security, so he's, he's safe. Uh, and, you know, I, I trust Jacob rees mogg could fight his way out of anything. He could. He's a tall guy. But, uh, but they, they, were, they were waving... One of them was waving uh, a flag of the Soviet Union, a yeah. communist flag, it, which I, is one of the most disgusting... I mean, how many millions of people were starved, tortured, I, no, beaten? Her horrendous. All of those are very valid points, and that's what the mail was saying. That was outrageous. What's interesting was Jacob's own statements, which, which yeah. is what he said. In a statement, rees -Mogg said it was a legitimate and peaceful, if noisy, protest. The Cardiff University security team was exemplary in allowing a lawful protest while keeping everyone safe. So he doesn't sound as bothered as, as the headlines sound. Well, that, that's what I love about Jacob rees yeah, He's a man of principle. He, yeah. sticks, he doesn't apply them in a partisan way. He sticks to his principles. An Englishman will, ne will walk but never run. He kind of exemplifies <laughs> that, doesn't he? <laughs> he, 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 stood there, he stood there just going, well, of course my team will handle this. It's An Englishman will walk but never run. Is no, that to do with the obesity crisis? No, that's, that's, <laughs> That's, that's a quote from a, a yeah. lyric in a police song. This is, his, <laughs> this is his inspirational speech before the London Marathon. That's, yeah. that's what he, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he does. It, that. Is, it is important to say this, and we, perhaps we don't do it enough, I certainly yes. don't, is West Streeting, Angela Ray yes. have all suffered the same thing this week yeah. from the same people. So, the, so what we're seeing is the same people yeah. are doing the same thing to people. I don't know really what they expect to gain. They're, let's not forget, there isn't so much that we can do. If they all stood up in, in harmony in Parliament and said, yeah. ceasefire now, there would not be... A what they expect to gain is publicity. If you want to draw a crowd, start a fight. Well, yeah, and these and work protesters aren't always, you know, they, they don't always have the most deep rooted, passionate, no. you know, deeply held beliefs. We've got another video now of uh, pro Palestine <laughs> protesters. Not more. Who don't seem Goodness to know why me. they're protesting. No, have a they look at this. It's hilarious. about anything else. Goal with tonight's uh, protest. I think the goal is just showing our support for Palestine and demanding that NYU stop. I honestly don't know. Okay. All of what well, NYU's doing. Is there something that NYU's doing? I really don't oh. know. I'm pretty sure they're... Do you know what NYU's doing? About Israel. Why are we protesting here? Yeah. I wish I was more educated. I'm not either. Oh. I, came from, I came from Columbia. I was there all back Columbia, and we came down. They said NYU students need their support. So I came down. I heard there's lots of cops. Some people were saying it was getting dangerous. I love how she says, I wish I was more educated. Those are students <laughs> at the most elite institutions in the States, like the NYU and Columbia. These are elite Ivy League universities. These people do not care about the Palestinians. Yeah.
but a lot of them are jumping on a bandwagon and just going, free Palestine, they don't know what they're saying. Yeah. It's just, oh, it, they're in a moment. They're yeah. caught in a moment. It's and it is, you're absolutely right, it is all. And actually, just put it, I don't want to be a party pooper on this, it's not quite what she said. So what they said in the, in the media, and I do my research on this sort of thing, she did know what she was talking about, she did know it was uh, about Palestine. We don't like what, nuanced research. Uh, we yet. love a bit of nuance. <laughs> There'll be many tears to this <laughs> argument. Sick. What yeah. she said is, I honestly don't know all of what NYU is doing. That yeah. was her quote. She didn't she say she was from another university. Yeah, she came from another one. So she didn't, she knew she was pro-Palestine. What was interesting, a similar sort of quote very recently, there was somebody holding up from the river to the sea, yeah. and one of the journalists said, well, which river, which sea? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. And a lot of people on these marches, it's the mob mentality, yeah, yeah. and that's the thing. The it's tribal, isn't it? Yeah. They've got the drums playing, everything. Oh, I like the drums. Oh, they've had cymbals as well. That was quite nice. That's, that's pretty. Right. That's good. But the drums are a bit... With the tribal thing, though, of course, what that does is it means that people are blindly following. Now, yes. I believe that she's supporting Palestine, but yeah. I only believe she's supporting Palestine because the mob are, because her friend group... Are, you know, it's a bit like... It, when when, when we were growing up, you know, you followed a certain... But, you know, yes. I was a big Oasis fan. I didn't like... Oh, Blair. which one did you like? Were, were, you, were you Noel Liam? Who do you like? Uh, well, I always liked Noel because he was a songwriter. But yeah. Oh, we'll talk about that later. We'll do that. Same, same <laughs> the football team. You support the team that, you know, you're sort of told yes. at school. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And the trouble with that is when it becomes political like this is you don't look any further. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's 100%. I, yeah. I, I agree with that. And they're out there getting their snaps for Instagram. Well, but they are. That's they what they want. Put... It's all about likes these days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 I just matter. I don't care what the cause is, but look at the lights. Look what I've got. Palestine is on a map. Yeah, well. yeah. No, no, we'll come on to that. Absolutely. Anyway, coming up, we will assess the week's winners and losers in Curster Blessed. This week, we've got an MP mocked for his knowledge of African geography, Alec Baldwin getting harassed, and a drag queen indoctrinating kids. But there's a twist. And we'll show you what happened when this lady tries virtual reality for the first time. Welcome back to the Saturday Night Showdown. Curster Blessed is coming up, but first, I promised I would show you what happened when this woman used virtual reality for the very first time. <laughs> glorious. Yeah, it's glorious work for uh, for a plaster or something. I, what I, I always think this section should be sponsored by personal injury lawyers because because <laughs> that's what have you sort of find every week it's wonderful yeah. stuff. People get injured in new and interesting ways. Well, it's now time to go through the winners and losers of the week in Curster Blessed. Anyway, how's your geography? Hopefully, it's better than Chris Phillips. But if it isn't, maybe you can be a government minister as well. Let's have a look. No, I, th I think there's an exclusion on people from Rwanda being sent they're to Rwanda. They're not from Rwanda, they're from Congo. <laughs> they're from and they're, Congo. And they're, they're supposedly <laughs> warring these people from Rwanda. Are they then going to be sent to Rwanda if they came here on a crossing? From, no, from Congo. Congo. Congo? Yeah. Would people be sent from... Well, I mean, Rwanda is a different country of Congo, isn't it? It's a different country. Yes, it is. Yes. Definitely. So if they come from the war then in, in Congo, would they then be... So uh, he was on Question Time this week, and uh, I've got some sympathy for him here. He was asked about a town called Goma, and yes. how could anybody be expected <laughs> to know where Goma is? I mean, he's the Minister for Policing, not the Minister for, you know, knowing where every single town in Africa is. It's, it's a lovely place. It's got a great coffee shop. It's in the, the Republic of Congo, and, and it's right next are to... You and... li are you making this up? No, yes, did of you, course. Did you Google this? No, no, but uh, what I can... I have a lot of sympathy for you, a bit of nuance on this, because yeah. actually, he didn't understand the question. Yeah. The guy was turning around and saying, look, my person was from Congo, yeah. they're in a war at the moment with Rwanda, what's going to happen if they get sent to Rwanda? That was his question. He was sort of working it out. He knew that Congo's next to Rwanda and you've, and you've got to, can you just up there? And you can keep going, there's Somalia, I can do the whole lot. And then um, you keep going, you, you finally get to Britain. I, 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 especially, <laughs> if you, I, especially if you take a boat. So the reality, <laughs> is, the reality is exactly that. So I did feel a bit sorry for him, but the way we were, oh, 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 oh
the, the faux educated oh. view from, from West Streeting there. Like, oh, of course we all know where Goma is, you Wally. But no one knows. You know, and it's the way you phrased the question as well. It was a gotcha moment. And it was. To him. He was trying to catch yeah, him out. I was. don't have any problem with people trying to catch yes. politicians out. But essentially what he was saying is, you know, there's a dispute between Rwanda and Congo. Yeah. Uh, Congo is obviously where they make Umbongo. They, they kill? They do. They do. Don't I don't. And, and, the, and he was saying, look, you know, if, if someone wanted to come from the Congo to the UK, would we send them to Rwanda? And of course, it's a stupid question, really. Yeah. We wouldn't do that. Yes, we would. <laughs> <laughs> of course we would. I can't wait to the first plane load of Congas <laughs> to get the way to Rwanda. <laughs> and they will be doing this, wouldn't they, all together in a line, <laughs> work on that base. And it is extraordinary, though, because they do need that clarity. So I do think it's one of those classic examples where it's that faux outrage, and it yeah. wasn't. I mean, it's all over the headlines, and we keep reporting and, and repeating it. He was trying to make the point, which is a valid point, and shows that, you know, the Rwanda policy actually, you know, does have a heart and isn't just, you know, sending people to their to their doom if that's that's what's happening. So if if sending you to Rwanda will cause you harm, then the government won't send you to Rwanda. Which Serious is... and irreversible harm. And he makes yeah. the point that it's in the legislation, that's what's going to protect Sounds you. Sounds like a Tavistock centre, doesn't it? Yeah, I just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Oh, like, Part of the cast report. report. It's, yeah, it's going to be good. Just what, what level of harm can you have? Can you have a grazed knee? I don't know. Anyway, uh, next up, we've got actor Alec Baldwin, who popped out for a cup of coffee and got a bit more than he bargained for. In three months' time, Baldwin goes on trial for involuntary manslaughter and after an encounter with so-called ambush interviewer called Crackhead Barney. <laughs> That's a fantastic name. Uh, he might quite fancy the peace and solitude of some jail time. Let's have a look. Alec, can you please stay free Palestine one time? Why did you kill that lady? You killed that lady and got no jail time? No jail time, Alec? Just stay free Palestine yeah. one time. One time. One time. One time, Alec. You know, he, you know he's a criminal. You know he's a criminal. Come on, Alec, just stay free Palestine one time. One time. Can you give me one quick favor? Ooh. Well, luckily for her, she, he wasn't armed that time, but he, he was. Uh, well, I, he did have his fists and he I, knocked the I, phone out of her hand. I, 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 he did, and quite rightly too. I, I, I can understand the anger. He's had to yeah. call the police, and they're deliberately ribbing him. Um, it's an appalling case. It was a, the, on the film set of Rust. Uh, yeah. Somebody died, and they're looking into it. There's criminal charges going through. They'll go through due process. But somebody coming up to you with... I, mean, I don't the crackhead Barney is a great name, so yeah. I'll let them off for that. But they're deliberately ribbing so they can get their views and their likes again. Yeah. and it's all about that sensational. So yeah. I've got a lot of sympathy for Alex. People do have a bad moment. That's what happens. Same as photographers. They're always doing... Yeah. Do all this sort of stuff. They want to get wound up. And they and, want to go with the celebrities and they get that them. picture of them looking angry. Yeah. And this is, yeah she's almost like a, a sort of American Mizzy. So she's like a crackhead, isn't she's, she? Yeah. That's she's what I mentally know. unhinged. Have yeah. you seen her? I saw her on Piers Morgan as well. Great. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, with the, the plasters co covering the nipples. It's, yeah, it's which I was, I was glad of those plasters, to be honest. <laughs> I, oh, yes, that was state bizarre, wasn't it? I think she was wearing a mask also. They always I, and I think and Piers, I know that was extraordinary, wasn't it? He, he was actually very oh, dignified about it. Face. He said, I'm, I'm happy face. to let you speak. Yeah. I'm happy to say this, but but let's... let's and then she was doing this dance performance artist <laughs> and everything. I was like, oh, all right, yeah, you can make your point. But it, and it then wasn't funny. He handled it brilliantly. But when you're out in the public and you don't have protection there and you're a celebrity yeah. and you get that sort of stuff and you deliver goes to him. He's very upset about the person dying, the, uh, the, the death of the, the person on the production on, on Rust. And it's a really tricky time. It's a massive drain on him. Yes, so I understand that. Yeah, I'm trying to work out the link between yeah. that and the Middle East conflict. Well, nothing. She, she deliberately, she wants to be provocative. Well, this, She's working on that sort of basis. Right. This okay. is why I don't have sympathy for Alec Baldwin. So he's a, a, a West Coast Hollywood liberal elite. And uh, I'm trying not to sound like Donald Trump here, but that's, that's what he is. I don't think he is a liberal. I, 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 I don't think I he is. I guarantee I... he's more liberal than me. So, well, that's not difficult. Sadly, we don't have any, any okay. internet in this, right. uh, or this evidence, building. But we don't need evidence to make points, do we, Leah? But so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, we also, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't need to research anything. But What's the, the point of so that? So, Alec Baldwin, as this, as this Hollywood <laughs> liberal, has, uh, you know, has been like, the, the, all the Hollywood liberals are like, oh, uh, protests are wonderful, everybody should protest. They usually tweet this from the safety of their gated compound. <laughs> Moving on, LGBTQ relationships are prohibited in Gaza, but 
allowed in Israel. So you'd think that a drag queen event in America would maybe take the side of Israel. But for the Valley Families for Palestine in Massachusetts, a queer story time for Palestine encouraged toddlers to promote the Palestinian cause as everyone in the room chanted for a free Palestine. Let's take a look at what a queer story time really looks like. Today what we're going to do is we're going to shout Free Palestine. Can I hear that? Free Palestine! If you're a drag queen and you know it, shout Free, free Palestine. Palestine! If you're a drag queen and you know it and you really want to show it, if you're a drag queen and you know it, shout Free Palestine! It's just refreshing to see a drag queen indoctrinating kids into something that doesn't involve pronouns and surgery on your genitals. You don't they see the hypocrisy in forcing children to sing this, Paul? It's, uh, not, it, it, it's not free. It's not you know. It's not their free. Idea. Well, well, I'm always interested when they say things. Like, if you're a, if you're a drag queen and you know it, I shout am. free Palestine. Well, uh, shout free Palestine, then please, Leo. But. Free Palestine from what? They're never very clear, are they? No. Uh, the idea is it's free Palestine from Israel, but Palestine need to be free from Hamas yes, before yeah. they can be yep. free from anything else. Yep. So, uh, what you know, there needs to be some context. This is poor kids are being used as political pawns. Yeah. yeah. No, you're absolutely... I'm talking of porn. I think they should shout out free Willy. And, and, uh, <laughs> because it would be far more appropriate. That's a dangerous <laughs> thing to shout <laughs> at a drag queen. <laughs> no, it's always a joy. Um, no, it's appalling. Absolutely appalling. These are little kids. Don't indoctrinate them, because what will happen? They will go out into the world singing this because they're completely innocent. They won't yeah. know. And they will get into all sorts of trouble. It is disgusting and shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, yeah. No, honestly, my, my sort of attitude to this has changed since I became a father. And now I'm very aware of the messages and the, you know, wh whoever's going into schools to, to spread whatever propaganda and whatever indoctrination. And, I mean, is this something that worries you, Kezia? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Right. And now world hunger. <laughs> what is, is Leo's child has started talking with a Scottish accent? Ah. <laughs> yeah. well, and I she was born in the UK. I don't yeah. care about if people want to, you know, become women or men. It doesn't bother me. I'm more worried about stuff like taxes and things, things that affect me. Yeah, but what if your taxes are getting taken off you to indoctrinate children it's into changing amount, gender? It's tiny amount. Yeah, but I don't want any of it spent on indoctrinating mm. children. I just yeah. think I've got... I've got bit, I'm more annoyed with this person saying, say, free Palestine. Yeah, and, that, but, and that's the point. Olds, yeah. Yeah, so, so we're not, we're not saying, not saying we're not saying people it. can't be trans or they can't so no, dress up as women. Not, so I think the principle is, is it's indoctrinating little but kids. Mixing it with that's politics, wrong. which has not, like Palestine thing is an issue which has nothing to do with you know transgender. It's and nothing yeah. to do with. Although it's not sexualised either. I mean, yeah. if that woman was. Uh, if that, if that a drag queen was supposed to be sexualised in some way, I think they've got it slightly wrong. But because they weren't, were they? They really weren't. It was, I'm not too sure what the fascination with drag queens are. It's interesting, right? And, you know, I don't really have an issue with it in the same way that Casey mm. uh, does. What? It's a bit like the pantomime dame. You know? Oh, no, it isn't. Well, love... <laughs> Where's your career? Behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love drag queens. But I love drag queens at 11pm on yeah. a, yes. you know, in a basement in Soho. I, yeah. don't, I don't love drag queens at 11am on a, I, in a public school. I have I never see, seen... I, I see them in... in the street. Everywhere, that's no, fine. Me. I've never seen Ian street. McKellen. Ian McKellen has never been happier than when he was on stage as Mother Goose and, and, and he was the dame and he was yeah. absolutely brilliant. And it's old Shakespeare, you no know, drag dressed as a girl. That's where it came from, from Shakespeare's time, because the men couldn't, but basically, they, they, you couldn't have female um, uh, actors, so yeah, they didn't the men used to do it. Act, and so. I think that's right. No, the, the thing which is abhorrent, though, is the indoctrination of little kids for anything, whether it's political and oh, so on. Yeah. So yeah, you have to keep an open politics. mind. But Talk about respect and so on and so yeah. forth. A kindness, all these great values. Yeah. Your yeah. kids, that's what they should be teaching. Absolutely. We're agreed on that. Next on the Saturday Night Showdown, we've got Culture Corner coming up and the fight that's erupted between the Queer Fat Club and Victoria Beckham. I'm not going to lie, if this was a cage fight, I'd put money on the Queer Fat Club. Plus, I'll show you what happened when this runner got to the finishing line. What a run by Forrest. Oh! And she's absolutely exhausted. <laughs> Welcome back to the Saturday Night Showdown. Culture Corner is coming up, but first I promised I would show you what happened when a tired-looking runner approached the finishing line. And what a run by Forrest. Oh! And she's absolutely exhausted here. Shakira King is about to collapse. Oh, my gosh! Hey. Oh, gosh. 
Oh, that's a shame. Have you, have you ever been so close, but so far? I, I, my whole life is so close, but so far. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we love it. No, glory. I, I felt so sorry for that. I, I love the, the videos once they show, when you get somebody who doesn't quite make it, and that somebody, another runner goes back and they help them over the line. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? That's a heartbreaking moment, and I think that's what we should get. It was get. like a metaphor for the Rwanda bill, that, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> Isn't that next to Conga? <laughs> we, yeah, absolutely. I've heard of that. Anyway, it's time now for Culture Corner. Victoria ah. Beck. Beckham's Mango collaboration has been criticised for lack of size inclu inclusivity. That's a new one. Uh, Posh's sp springtime collection is only available in sizes 6 to 14, with most items only being available up to a size 12. Body image advocates are slamming the pop star for excluding them. Uh, with body positive, which means fat, style influencer Stephanie Yeboah saying that bigger bodies are deserving of clothing too, in between mouthfuls of cheesecake. For, for what it's worth, Mango <laughs> have apologised for inconvenience or disappointment caused by the size availability or lack thereof, and have issued a statement saying that there's a tent shop next door which should have something that fits. <laughs> now... <laughs> My issue with this is, yes. and Katie, I'll ask you because you're obviously you know, fashion conscious. And obviously, so fat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you're obviously fashion conscious. And I? I mean, <laughs> I've been stuck Look, in the 90s. Speaking, yeah, I've been literally know. wearing the same outfit since like 1998. Well, everyone, so. else, everyone else is wearing TK but Maxx. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, fashion labels, yeah. I think if you're an exclusive fashion label, you don't want your stuff being stretched over, you know, the very large buttocks of a fat person and, you know, it being sort of shown in public like that. So t two, two points here. I do think that um, bigger-sized women should be included. I mean, <laughs> they're human beings too, right? Yeah. <laughs> they I'm should not, have not access. that they're human. <laughs> they, they should have access to the same things as skinny what, people even have. Even, like, absolute runway fashion? Yes. But that's not, not designed. It's, it's not designed right, to... It's, yeah. it's right. two-part answer You know, this is art. This is yes. two-part answer to this. OK, the second, the second uh, part is when I go shopping to get clothes, they have too many sizes, 16, 18, 14, and it's just piled up because all the size 6s and 8s and 4s go really, really quickly. Yeah. So just put one or two yeah. just to keep everyone happy, size 20 or size 18, and put loads and loads of size 6s for yeah. us little people. It, it's a good point. In defence of the independent... Republic of Mango, which is next to Rwanda, by the way. Um, you can work out they do, they do too. <laughs> look, I'm looking at the link. <laughs> Republic of Mango. <laughs> That's what it's called. This is the name of the retailer. Oh, yes, so Mango. The, this is the retailer. They do plus sizes. So, and it depends on the range. So, what they do, there are certain styles which might fit uh, the larger lady or gentleman who wants to dress as a lady, and they can go to those particular size. As Leo says, you can turn around and say, there's particular items, they're not really appropriate if, if you're beyond a certain size. They wouldn't look as good as others. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> Next, next, let's take a look at what happened when this man decided to take it upon himself to crash the Queer Fat Club. This is a Queer Fat Club. Um, I'm, I'm queer and fat. Okay, thank you for joining. We're just um, introducing ourselves at the moment. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Joe? Yeah, uh, my name's Joe. I go by he, they, and uh, I identify as 275 pounds. Okay, okay. Um <laughs> now, Joe, uh, might, he might have been trolling. I'm not sure if he genuinely <laughs> identifies as £275. He was asked to leave the group. But here's the question. Why can't someone identify as fat? Surely whether you self-identify as fat or not is more subjective than your, your gender. I say well done to Joe for exposing such a nonsensical organisation. And why, why are some things... Kezia, why, why is identifying as women OK but identifying as a, a fat woman not OK? But there's so many, like, very skinny women who think they're fat, so they mm. actually ident they see themselves as fat. They really and they have a problem. You know, yes. they've got oh well, anorexia. You're, you're right, and yeah. that's that's Probably a real so serious issue. And so you know, they identify with it, and it's really genuine actually yeah. to them. There's no, they're not playing around. They look in the mirror, they feel sad, yes. and they say, "I'm fat." And it can have be a hundred people around them going, "You're you're not. Mm. You're really skinny." But yeah. they can't hear that. So I think actually that's really identifying the body dysmorphia. And yeah. it's interesting. I mean, it is the same, this a similar issue to to gender dysphoria. Uh, and in okay. fact, if you look at the the Google searches, the, yes. the Google searches for anorexia, it's tailed off oh, no. as the as the Google 
searches for body dysmorphia and gender yeah. transitioning have, have increased. It is absolutely appalling, and you're absolutely right to call it out. Uh, I think the language pattern, however, gave it away. And what he says is, uh, I identify yeah. as a 275-pound uh, woman. And, uh, and what, the other thing they missed is the it's name... and brave women. The other thing they missed was the, the name of the club, because whilst I think the Queer Fat Club is good, I also like the idea we should be more inclusive. I think we should call it Trans Fat, because this <laughs> is... Because <a>, that <laughs> clogs your arteries. I think it would be very good and confuse the hell out of people. Yeah. But also, skinny people can actually be fat. My mate Nico, he's a comedian, and he went to the doctor. You look at him, you'd think he's the, he's the figure of health. He went to the doctor, and the doctor told him he's fat skinny. He's got uh, visceral fat in, with inside, yeah. yeah. inside him. I mean, I do have not, some not sympathy for this fact. I mean, what goes on at Trans Fat Club should, trans stay, <laughs> should, should stay at Trans Fat Club. <laughs> but, I mean... They, they, they get to get, they've got together these, these women, largely yes. women, I think. Largely women was not a pun. <laughs> um, and they, the, the, for their opportunity to just be themselves, and yeah. then he, he gate crashes. It seems a little unfair, but he is doing everything we like to do, Leo, which is yeah. expose the hypocrisy. It's and have some fun. Anyway, next on the Saturday Night Showdown, it's our journey into clown world with Biden's latest gaffe. Brexiteers still crying. It's been eight years, guys. Get over it. And a <laughs> flamethrowing robot dog. Plus, I'll show you what happened with this man went swinging. Whee! Welcome back to the Saturday Night Showdown. Clown World is coming up, but first I promised I would show you what happened when a grown man tried out a child's swing. Whee! Whee! Oh, roasted nuts! <laughs> <laughs> We, we knew what was going to happen. Yeah. We did. Come on. What I love, we were talking about this in the break, uh, somebody ready with their camera, saying, there's a fire here, yeah. there's, a, there's a man on a child swing. You've been framed. Uh, you've been framed. I can send it into Leo's show. Personal, <laughs> personal injury lawyers will sponsor it. We love it. It's got to be good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Whoa! There is again. Oh! There's no chance that rope holding. Uh, anyway, <laughs> now let's finish the show with Clown World, where we look at the funny videos circulating this week. Not for the first time, Joe Biden leads the way. Let's take a look. Imagine what we can do next. Four more years. Pause. Four more years. He just read out what was on the audio cue. <laughs> That's incredible. Pause. Chat to panellists. Yes. Joe Biden might be a bit unsteady on his feet and a bit dithery, but at least he can still read Kezio. <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> Paul, do you, think, uh, do you think he's actually going to make it all the way to the election? Uh, do you mean will he be alive or will they oust him? Just, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure if, like, being dead would be that... It wouldn't stop you, not me. in the American... You could be guilty of all sorts of things, including being dead. Yeah. So he's 81, he's 81 yeah. at the moment, and a good old Trump, who, who's identifying himself as innocent at the moment, yeah. uh, which I like, so you can do anything. Um, so he's 77, and that's what I do. Our uh, politicians basically pale into insignificance, don't they? They're, they're all youngsters. Yeah. But I feel a bit sorry for poor old Sleepy Joe, because it was a clear gaffe on that sort of thing, and he's stumbling all over the place. Well, he's just he's kept on reading on that, that auto cue. I mean, maybe Borat should be pressed. Take a look at this. <laughs> this suit is black. Pause. You know what a pause is? Yes. This suit is black. Not. This suit is black. Pause. Not. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I think Borat would do a better job right now. Now, picture the scene. You go to get the supermarket shopping just before closing on a Sunday afternoon and the shelves are empty. Who do you blame for this? Maybe you blame yourself for not shopping earlier in the day before the stock sold out. Well, not if you're Liz Webster. Oh, no, there's only two reasons that a supermarket would have empty shelves at 4.55pm <laughs> on a Sunday. The dynamic duo of Brexit and climate change. Goodness. Now, this is... <laughs> This never gets boring for me. I, people, people saying, "Oh, the, the supermarket shops are empty on a Sunday afternoon. This is Brexit. Why did you do this?" To what, what, what I find it's extraordinary Brexit. is, well, I don't know the picture's still there, but if you look on the left-hand side, um, they've got just a whole load of cucumbers. So I don't know what Brexit yeah. did to cucumbers, but we've got a, <laughs> there. They are. Look, have a look. But on the left-hand <laughs> side, the only things they've got are cucumbers. Yeah. It's because Europe doesn't need to make them bendy anymore. <laughs> But, I mean, I, I voted Remain, but when Ooh. I see stuff like this, it makes me... It makes me <laughs> like, swap? wish I could go back <laughs> and vote Leave. It's, it's insane. And also, people, you know, why can't people just get over it, Paul? Well, it's exactly it. Well, I don't know why they can't get over it. It's like, it's just like this endless breakup, isn't it? It's like, yeah. she left you, mate. Move over it. Yeah. But it's ridiculous. And... and uh, 
it, not so much Brexit thing, because we can all laugh about Brexit now. It was eight years ago, we can't all laugh about Brexit. But it, it, is, it is funny to people keep trudging it up. However, the climate change thing, everything is climate change. Oh, that's, that's the gift that keeps giving. If you trip over in the street, it's yeah. because of climate oh. change. Yes. Yeah, if it's warm, it's climate change. It's... If it's cold, it's climate change. Yeah, I know, you can't win, can you? It's freezing out here right now. It's like late April, it's yeah. freezing. Suddenly, no one's really talking about climate change Not unless yet. it comes to supermarket shelves. And also with climate change, they always say, oh, we're having the, this is the wettest weather, or the coldest yes. weather, or the hottest weather in 100 years or yes. in 200 years. And it's like, well, what was making it so hot 200 years ago? Yes. Was that what was the... making it hot in the dinosaur age? And exactly. Tudor, do you know the, during the Tudor times? The dinosaurs used were... to love those so Tudors, yeah, didn't they? The <laughs> they didn't eat really... them, but they, <laughs> they were growing. They were growing grapes in this country. It was uh, very warm. In the I... Tudor, Tudor yeah. era. They were with the dinosaurs. I, and I love, I love and the fact... Yes, and the dinosaurs <laughs> I love the fact the reason of the Tudors... The reason the Tudors are extinct is because the dinosaurs ate them. I think that's brilliant. That's why they ate them. This is the History Channel. This is amazing. We're learning. We're learning. Uh, and now, finally, we have a solution ahead of the next wildfire. A company in Ohio have invented and put up for sale a flame-throwing robotic dog. <laughs> what a bargain! <laughs> Less than ten thousand dollars. Let's have a look at this thing. <laughs> Buy these, to be honest. I thought XL bullies were bad. Well, I, I, I love it. It's a terrier fying, isn't it? Works on that. Let's see what I did there. Uh, yeah, a bit of labracadabra. Um, labracadabra. I, I, I'm here all week. I'm here all week. Um, what I love about it is they say in the report that actually it depends on a state by state basis whether or not this counts as a weapon. Right. So you, you might be able to take one of those to the park. I, it is what happens when you get the world's stupidest people and give them the world's top technology <laughs> with this stuff. Now, please well, explain to me, how does a fire-breathing robotic dog put out a forest fire? Oh, well, it, it starts them. It starts them. There's a different fires. one with water. I think it this is, this but is the one with water, I thought, that's a good idea. It is a good Basically idea. Basically a water cannon on legs. That's what they can do. And that, what they do, they try and rescue the Tudors from the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that are making grapes. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I love it. It's dangerous it's because, good. I mean, those Tudor buildings, they're all wooden. It's exactly. Like in pitch and tar. You don't believe me that they were growing grapes in England. I do. I firmly time. believe that they were growing grapes. Because, you know, they were in Roman times as well, weren't they? They were. No, but where? about in England? Yeah. Oh, okay, so, well, what, what was the... Okay, we're well, going back on that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Was that? We know why, because we've must been the fire-breathing dog yes, that did it. Climate changes. Dragons. <laughs> fire-breathing fire dragons. <laughs> yeah. That's what, what it was doing. What it. I don't want to change is dogs into fire-breathing dogs. Uh, I mean, like you say about the XL bullies, the sort of people who have had XL bullies will have a fire-breathing They will have that. Dog, I'll have it. I'm buying they, one They'll have one of those instead. I'm buying one of those things. I want one. They are very like my house. That doesn't reassure me at all. I just wish they'd Perfect, like robot butlers before they started putting flamethrowers on them. Anyway, up next, it's Mark Dolan tonight. What have you got for us this evening, Mark? So much to get through this evening. It is your perfect Saturday night in. Let me tell you, another Tory defection, this time to Labour. Is it the nail in the coffin for Rishi Sunak's premiership? Plus, the BBC want to sweep their inquiry into Hugh Edwards under the carpet. Well, that's not happening, not on my watch. That's my big opinion. Plus, in my take at 10, Andrew Neil has attacked GB News. I'll be responding at 10, and you won't want to miss it. Sounds amazing, Mark. And I saw that, I saw that defection from the Tory party to the Labour party, and he said, I couldn't look people in the eye as a, as a Conservative. It's like, you didn't want to look people in the eye at the job centre. You're just trying to keep your job. <laughs> anyway, thanks to my brilliant <laughs> panel tonight, but Kezia Noble, Andrew Eborn and Paul Cox, and to all of our wonderful viewers. We'll see you again next week. The fantastic Mark Dolan tonight is next. Just as, you, just as you heard, and don't forget headliners as well, tonight at 11 p.m. See you next week. Bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.